Good evening, uh, good afternoon, or good morning, everyone. It depends, obviously, where you are. Um, thank you for coming on this uh, webinar by Dr. Eric Rees, Headaches and Migraines, Are They Only in Your Head? I think this has generated a lot of questions, a lot of um, you know thought processes for people, because I think this is probably the best attended webinar that we've had. Um, I'm actually coming live to you from uh, my house in Spain. Uh, Dr. Eric Rees is currently in the UK. Uh, I think quite a few of you got to know Eric now. He's been involved with our educational program for quite a bit now. And uh, he's currently residing in the US, uh, supporting his wife at, uh, with a senior management placement, running his clinic in uh, Minneapolis remotely. But let me give you a little bit of a remit about Dr. Eric. <clears throat> he's a doctor of chiropractic medicine, board certified chiropractic neurologist at the Neural Connection, which is in Minneapolis. He received his doctorate in chiropractic from Northwestern Health Science University, graduating with magnum cum laude honors. He currently holds a diplomat in functional neurology from the American Chiropractic Neurology Board and has completed thousands of hours of additional postgraduate coursework utilizing clinical application and therapeutic interventions in the neurological and nutritional rehabilitation of traumatic brain injuries, concussions, vestibular disorders through the Carrick Institute of Clinical Neuroscience. And I think Eric, as well as everybody else, actually is quite surprised I got through that without any stutters. Um, being non a non-medical person, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a little bit new to me. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you across to Eric. Oh, one final thing. If you look at down the right-hand side, you'll see a questions part. Um, by all means, ask questions as we go along, and by the time Dr. Eric finishes his presentation, uh, we can fire them at, uh, at him and, uh, and do the best we can. So, Eric, I will get rid of my ugly face off the screen and leave it all to you. Thanks, Simon. I appreciate that. I will say I was very impressed with your ability to communicate that effectively. If anything, that made me realize I need to rewrite my bio. So, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, uh, from the sounds of it, it sounds like we have a decent amount of people uh, from all over the world. So um, thank you for joining us today, uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, depending on where you're at. Uh, I think that this topic is something <clears throat> that is constantly evolving, uh, especially in the space of neuroorthopedic injury rehabilitation. And whether you're a physiotherapist, a physical therapist, a chiropractor, a neurologist, an osteopath, I mean, uh, this information is relevant to all of us because of the prevalence of headaches and migraines, uh, the, the cost uh, from, from globally, from societal, personal, and professional costs. And then more importantly, too, this research is always changing. Um, you know, some of the things that I did research for just for this lecture uh, taught me some new things, uh, some outdated the theories and understandings of headaches and migraines uh, where we're at currently today. Uh, this topic will always continue to change as we learn more about the brain, the body, um, and amazing uh, tools like low-level laser therapy. So um, here's our agenda for today. Uh, we're going to go through and we're going to just talk about the various mechanisms of what is actually going on with headaches and, and, and migraines. Um, we're going to go ahead and talk about all the structural, the neurological, and even the metabolic cascades of pain and trauma as it relates to the brain and body. Um, because these are things that not all providers or practitioners actually understand and know. Um, and outside of those who are actively seeking this, some of this information is, is relatively hidden um, from a lot of mainstream medical providers. Uh, but sadly, a lot of doctors, uh, even uh, within our own professions, don't actually know or understand this. And this is really important for us to understand because it gives us opportunities and tools to help the patients that are in front of us. We're going to talk about the research coming out, talking about functional neurology and rehabilitation. The uses of like low-level laser therapy. We'll talk about some of the best practices and evidence-based assessments for diagnosing and treating um, migraines and, and headaches as well too because what kind of a webinar would this be if we only talked about the understanding of it without giving you any clinical outcomes or, or clinical tools. So we're going to make sure we discuss those and I always like to start my lectures off with just a, a, little, a little bit of an understanding of why we do what we do. Now, I'm sure all of us got into medicine or got into the professions that we're in for some reason, uh, probably personal to us. Um, I got into medicine because I knew that I wanted to help people with my life. And more importantly, too, I saw people in my life struggle. Um, I lost my grandfather to Alzheimer's and cancer in 2014. That was probably one of the most difficult things for me to witness. Uh, I was finishing up 
school at that time, uh, living across the country. I was living in Oregon at the time and I grew up in the Midwest. And so it was really hard for me to take note about how significant the changes were when I would see my grandfather after days, weeks, months, and sometimes after a year or two. It was devastating. Um, unfortunately, that taught me a really important life lesson that, um, you know, health truly is your wealth. Because I've played contact sports my entire life. Hockey and soccer, football, as they call it over here in Europe, uh, has really been my bread and butter. And I'm very fortunate that I've never had a game ending or a season ending injury with a concussion or a head injury. But inevitably, what the research is pointing to now is that it's actually not those one off head injuries or concussions that are really the biggest issue. It's the repetitive sub concussive hits over time that amounts to repetitive injuries, repetitive inflammatory cascades. And this is really my purpose because I have a wife. I'm ready to start a family. Um, and at the end of the day, I think we can all attest to this, that we all want to live a life worth living. We all want to live a life with zero limitations. We want to be able to have our cake and eat it too and, and go after the goals and the things that we want to accomplish in life. And this is one of the reasons why I, I really truly believe uh, in what Arconia is doing and creating with their low-level lasers. But it's a, it's a reason why I've used this as a tool in my, in my clinic. I, I've clinically seen the benefits of it. I've personally experienced the benefits of it. And more importantly, too, uh, you know, putting your reputation on the line and going through the FDA approval trial process, which is something we'll touch on later, is something that I really believe in. And, and I really feel as though our professions need more of uh, corporations and organizations putting their reputation on the line with research. And so let's dig into this a little bit. Uh, headaches and migraines really account for 5% of all medical admissions to hospitals and 20% of all neurological outpatient consultations. Uh, migraines at the core are really one of the most debil debilitating brain disorders and they affect up to 20% of the global population. If we have 7 billion people in the world right now, I mean, that's nearly 1.75 billion people who suffer from migraines. And, and unfortunately, these, these migraines have a societal cost, they have an individual cost, they have a working cost as well for lost days, days of, days of taking sick leave that there is significant financial and psychological burden to society. And, and really, we, when we're breaking down migraines and headaches, there are two classic kind of presentations, right? So the first set is patients who present with existing primary headaches. These are people who have had headaches as children or adolescents, they're grown to be an adult. Others sometimes just start having a headache one day and they never go away. Now, there are clearly underlying mechanisms with these patterns. But history also plays a significant role with this. And I'm talking about concussions. Yes, I'm talking about brain injuries, but I'm also talking about auto accidents. I'm talking about slips and falls, common mistakes, common failures that we have just living, bumping our head, right? Having an accident at the gym. And, and where this really starts to get interesting is when we break down the individuality between every person, every brain, and every body you have in your office, this is one of the reasons why we need to treat people as individuals because they are, there are no two brains that are alike, there are no two bodies that are alike. And when trauma is affected or trauma is a factor in this equation, and even when it's not physical trauma, it could be psychological trauma. We know that different types of stressors can have biochemical and inflammatory cascades that result in different types of presentations for symptoms. I always bring this up to my patients because they kind of understand this analogy is that anytime there's a traumatic event, we, we kind of have a little bit of a disconnect going on. It's kind of like pouring water on my laptop um, I can't necessarily tell you what systems are going to work, what systems aren't going to work after that event. But that's why we have to reboot the laptop. That's why we check, do inputs match outputs. We looked at the hard drive, we look at the software, we check different programs. And it's the same thing that you do clinically with your orthopedic examination via bedside with your patients. You want to check and find things that work and things that don't work. And then clinically, you address the things that, that don't work. Or you can utilize the things that do work to affect different areas of the brain and body as a result of that. Everything's connected. And so when, when trauma is a factor, we really have to look at this and, and, and understand a couple of different mechanisms at play. First, uh, if you had three friends that went to the same party, you would expect them to tell you relatively the same story about that party. And that makes sense, right? The location, who was there, what time it was, basic information. Well, the brain doesn't really have that luxury of always knowing who's telling the truth and who isn't. So the brain, the three friends, the three major pathways when dealing with inputs and outputs for the brain are number one, muscles and joints. So as structural integration specialists, as chiropractors, as physical therapists, physios, osteopaths, you have an opportunity to change the structure of your, of your patient's body. And this is really important because we're always at mercy to gravity and gravity is always giving us feedback. 
our muscles and joints are always fighting the gravity that we exert and we experience on Earth. And this is important. This is really beneficial for us because it actually activates and stimulates our brain. Well, this is one of the fundamental reasons why when astronauts go to space, they can't stay for very long is because they lose that gravitational input to the brain. They lose the activation of their nervous system on a consistent basis, and they have to work out two, three hours a day. So friend number one for us will always be muscles and joints. Friend number two is your eyes. It was relevant for headaches and migraines, right? How many patients come in talking about visual auras, changes in their visual patterns, having blurry vision, double vision, triple vision sometimes. Your eyes are a window into the brain. And it's not just your visual system or your eyeball itself. I'm talking about the cornea, you know, the lens, like the physical attribute of the eye. I'm talking about a lot of the software, the retina, all the way back to the occipital cortex and even into the brain stem. These are really important areas of integration. And these are vulnerable areas that can be damaged with trauma. The third system that we're talking about, the third friend that goes to that party is your, is your vestibular system, your inner ear system. And this is the system that becomes active on elevators, escalators, any sort of translate, translational movement, any sort of change in your relationship with gravity will activate your inner ear system. And these are really the three friends that your brain uses primarily to tell you where you're at in space. And so these are the three friends that go to the same party. And these three friends need to relatively say the same thing about that party. When trauma is involved, and in a lot of situations, when headaches and migraines are implicated, these three friends go to the same party and they tell your brain completely different stories. And the problem with that is that your brain just can't look out the window and say, oh, well, this is right, this is wrong. It just takes that information and it says, okay, well, this is what we're going to do with it. And so inputs need to match outputs. Well, lo and behold, one of the proposed mechanisms of migraines, and this is the latest proposed mechanism of migraine, is that migraines are actually due to changes in the brain's neurological function from altered sensory processing. Interesting. So what we see with trauma, what we also see with migraines, is that we see a lack of sensory integration. And it's not that your sensory systems aren't working. It's just maybe they're not working well together. Maybe one area is telling that your, your brain something a little bit different than the other area, and your brain can't tell the difference, and so it just makes the best of all of those. Maybe that results in a bit of a head tilt. Maybe not. Maybe one of your eyes is skewed. Maybe you have a little hypertrophy area of an exophoria coming in. Maybe that means you have a little bit more muscle tone on one side of your neck versus the other. What's, what does the Torah call us? And do we really know and understand these mechanisms? Well, we really don't. The first phase of this purported mechanism involves trigeminal durovascular afferent pathways. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, trigeminal, your trigeminal system, cranial nerve five, durovascular, meaning that the vascularity around your dura, right? And, and, and all the altered integration of what's going on with these systems. This is what triggers brainstem and subcortical areas of the brain to induce light and sound sensitivity. It's followed by changes in the autonomic nervous system, the fight or flight response that is so coveted and so important for us. And then afterwards, we have this prodromal phase that leads to resolution of symptoms, hopefully, because how many of you on this call have patients that don't ever get relief? Or maybe they get temporary relief, but they go right back to the same setting that they were in before. It's troubling. It's unfortunate because migraines are the most common cause of recurrent severe headaches. 20% of women globally will experience a, a migraine at some point in their life. And it's a two to one ratio of women to men. And unfortunately, what we're finding is that there is a genetic basis for individuals who suffer from migraines. But these attacks can be triggered by either internal and external influences. And, and to be honest with you, we still don't understand all these mechanisms fully because they can happen for no apparent reason. Of interesting note, and we already alluded to this a little bit, migraines are usually accompanied by other symptoms, nausea, dizziness, light sensitivity, changes in bowel function, alterations in their appetite. What system encompasses all of those? Your autonomic nervous system. And this autonomic nervous system is the automatic mechanism that controls heart rate regulation, blood pressure, digestion, really basic mechanisms that we shouldn't really have to think about. And so what happens over time is that a majority of these patients, not only are they dealing with autonomic outcomes, but they're also dealing with other symptoms like depression, anxiety, chronic pain syndromes, cervical pain, head pain, sleep apnea, POTS, what are we looking at with these mechanisms? Well, there's clearly more to the story. Your autonomic nervous system is probably going to be involved with this. An imbalance of your sympathetic and parasympathetic system is probably inevitable at some point. And, and more importantly, too, with a traumatic outcome, what's going on with the musculoskeletal system? Are inputs matching outputs? Do we now have 
different type of ligamentous damage, muscular strain, different types of sprain mechanisms. What's going on from a muscular standpoint? Do we have hypertonicity of these muscles that are really important to give us proprioceptive feedback? We'll talk about later in the lecture about how important your cervical spine inputs are to the brain because they're one of the majority drivers of proprioceptive feedback of the head and the neck. There's a lot of real estate of our cervical spine that's integrated into our somatosensory uh, mechanisms. And so these maps become skewed. Now we think we're gonna put our finger to our nose, we put our finger to our cheek. Maybe the cerebellar circuits come off. And we have this whole cascade of neurological dysfunction that can occur, which is why it's super important to understand these mechanisms because not everything is how it appears. Referral patterns from the sternocleidomastoid, masseter, the trapezius. Of interesting note, what are common hypertonic muscles that you see clinically in your office? The SEM, temporalis, the trapezius, levator, levator scapulae. Well, look at these referral patterns. They refer all over the head. They refer all over the shoulder, all over the neck. And so, yes, you have to look at your patient structurally. Yes, you have to look at them neurologically. And as we'll talk about later, you also have to look at them metabolically because there are some very important mechanisms at play here. And the new research coming out is kind of alluding to the fact that there's a lot of opportunities to help these patients. Even looking at transcran transcranial magnetic stimulation, this is direct current magnetic simulation, vagal nerve stimulation. We're going to talk about that extensively today because it's so important. Current, current therapies and modalities with, within the Western medicine space is looking at greater nerve occipital blocks, uh, greater occipital nerve blocks, Botox injections to the suboccipital muscle groups. Intravenous magnesium supplementation IV therapies can be very, very beneficial. For a lot of the manual therapists out there, of course we're going to look at the look at the neck, look at the spine, look at opportunities for us to be able to modulate different proprioceptive circuits and different feedback mechanisms. And of importance too, low-level laser therapy, light therapy, concentrated collimated light therapy. Now, what I find interesting with this is that there's not one size that fits all, right? They're all tools in our tool belt. And my goal today is to give you adequate tools in your tool belt to allow you the understanding and the opportunities to really look into why you would want to utilize some of these. Now, what's important for this is that it's important for us to understand that Erconia has 21 of the 24 patents for FDA approval for low-level laser therapy. Erconia has repeatedly put their reputation on the line time and time again to show why their tools, why their low-level laser modalities are the best of the best. And in their study, there was a 45.4 decrease in visual analog scores with the use of low-level laser therapy over the head and the neck. Now, we'll allude to this later today, but Erconi has 21 of the 24 patents for FDA approval for common musculoskeletal complaints, back pain, plantar fasciitis, neck pain, shoulder pain. They're also doing research into understanding does low-level laser have an effect on autism. The best part about this is that it's non-invasive. So why low-level laser therapy? Like what, what is low-level laser therapy? Low-level laser therapy is collimated, concentrated light therapy, specifically in 600 and 900 nanometers. And this is one of the mechanisms that's really important for why Arconia has landed on the 635 nanometer wavelength mechanism for their FX635 and for their EVRL and also for their other handhelds. Is because when you look at the specific curves of absorption, these photoreceptors specifically respond to these lower-level laser uh, wavelengths. We have, we have providers all the time asking us, what kind of therapies, how, how should I use these lasers? What, what kind of frequency should I use? And I, and I come back to this time and time again, the biggest mechanism, the biggest effect on the efficacy of you using your laser is one, you actually using it, and two, understanding that Erconi has already done the dirty work for you. This 635 nanometer wavelength specifically activates the cytochrome C oxidase enzyme in the mitochondria. This is the fourth complex in the, in the electron chain tr transport, that's really important. And this is actually the rate limiting, uh, rate limiting enzyme for this mechanism. And what happens here is as low level laser light, these photons are absorbed in the mitochondria. What they do is they upregulate the cytochrome C oxidase enzyme. They increase ATP production of this fourth complex, which leads to increased ATP production for the cells overall. Now, this is really important because it's not just ATP production. There's actually nitric oxide outcomes. Nitric oxide is a local vasodilator. And so what we see is when the cytochrome C oxidase mechanism becomes activated through low-level laser light, we have the release of nitric oxide. 
which is a local vasodilator, meaning that it brings, it vasodilates the tissues locally, bringing, bringing more blood flow, more oxygen, and more nutrients to the tissues as well. We also have a reactive oxygen species mechanism, which is a chemotaxic mechanism in low doses. It's actually bring uh, anti-inflammatory mediators into the cell to heal, to simulate different types of cellular processes to allow the cell to recover and have more of a buffer zone, we'll say, to be able to handle and take hits and to be able to recover itself. And so what's amazing with this is the low-level laser therapy not only works on a mitochondrial level, but it affects cells. It has downstream cellular effects for cellular pro proliferation, cellular migration, and different types of adhesion outcomes. It can control cellular death and reduce the expression of proteins that actually in inhibit cellular ap aptosis. Well, this is really interesting because as we start getting into these different mechanisms of inflammation, and we see dysfunction in different areas of the nervous system, utilizing low level laser therapy can be very beneficial and very influential in allowing the system to heal. So as we get into this migraine, this chronic pain, this headache mechanism, we have to understand the autonomic nervous system. And this might be taking you back to the early days in medical school, but we're gonna go through this really quick. So your autonomic nervous system has two divisions. You have your sympathetic nervous system and you have your parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is the classic system of OD associated with fight, flight, or freeze. And it's involved in both cardiac and vascular regulation of these responses. In a heightened sympathetic state, you'll see changes and in increases in heart rate, myocardial contractibility, coronary vasodilation, but you're also gonna see changes in blood flow to the gut. If you're running away from a bear, you don't have to have any adequate blood flow to your digestive tract or your digestive system. You don't have to have an immune response, so that gets shunted as well too. And this becomes a problem in chronically sympathetic or chronically stressed states. And this is one of the big main mechanisms for why our current health and our chronic obesity epidemic is, is wreaking havoc on our society, is that when people are chronically stressed, their immune systems are chronically depressed, their digestive systems don't work as well. There are changes in the metabolic, the cellular, the, the glucose levels and, the, and our ability to utilize insulin effectively. And we see these secondary and tertiary cascade mechanisms that really affect us structurally, neurologically, and metabolically. So the opposite of this system, the sympathetic system, is your parasympathetic system. This is the yin to the yang, if you wanna utilize that, 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 that metaphor. This is involved specifically during quiet conditions. This is the rest and digest mechanism. So what do we see? Well, we see decreased heart rate, decreased myocardial contractility. We see increases in blood flow to the gut into the digestive system. We see increased activation of the immune system as well. But these systems are also heavily involved in pain reg regulation and inflammation, specifically the sympathetic nervous system and its, and its detrimental effects with triggering pain regulation and inflammation. Chronic regional pain syndrome is actually usually due to increases in sympathetic windup of specific circuits within the brain, leading to higher amounts of pro inflammatory media production of, of neurons. And also, too, it also leads to chronic inflammation, chronic inflammatory pathways that continue to wind up as a result of increased sympathetic tone. This is a problem because your autonomic nervous system affects every, virtually all organs and tissues throughout your brain and body cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, regulation of blood pressure, GI responses, visual focus, thermal regulation of the body. So when we see changes or dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, we have to take a look and understand that this could have global effects throughout the brain and body. This is really important for migraines and, and different types of chronic pain syndromes as well too, because this affects all the tissues. And that's why when we have different types of dis, uh, dysautonomia going on in the brain and body, we can have an array of outcomes that don't always make sense, that don't always add up. More importantly, when we get trauma involved, we have various stress responses. We have a catecholamine surge, triggering inflammatory responses, changing your immune, your immune function. Your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis becomes negatively affected. And where this really gets interesting is when we start understanding and digging deeper into the, the significant outcomes that can occur when you utilize, when you understand the power of the vagus nerve and utilize different types of vagal nerve stimulation. This is, there's a reason why this is one of the leading uh, therapies being looked at with migraines, is because the vagus nerve provides an extensive afferent and efferent network of innervation to the viscera. And it's really an interface between the outside of the body and the central nervous system. Now, it's 80% sensory afferent information going into the brain, and it's 20% motor efferent fibers that are coming out. 
and we still don't fully understand the mechanism or the, or the innervation of the vagus nerve, but there are a couple really interesting mechanisms that have been, that have been found to promote anti-inflammatory properties and the, and the balancing of your autonomic nervous system via the vagus nerve. What they've found is that the stimulation, the anti-inflammatory stimulation via vagal nerve stimulation is actually one of the main mechanisms through the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It regulates the release of cortisol in the adrenal gland. Now, a problem with the adrenal gland over time is that if you're always under stress, you're always releasing cortisol. There are different th theories as to whether or not you can actually have cortisol or adrenal depletion of this. But one of the mechanisms that could control that in a non-chronic state can be the release of cortisol and the appropriate use of cortisol. Now, there are different types of cortisol that is actually released from the hypo hypothalamus. But why do they give you cortisol or cortisone shots for chronic inflammatory issue for your knee or your elbow or your shoulder? It's a dampened inflammation. And this is one of the main mechanisms that vagal nerve stimulation utilizes. There's also a cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway that occurs. And what happens is that acetylcholine is released at the synaptic junction and it binds with macrophages, these alpha-7 nicotinic ACH receptors on macrophages. And it actually stops the release of tumor necrosis factor alpha. We'll talk about this more in detail, but tumor necrosis factor alpha and IL-6 are two of the most potent and prominent inflammatory mediators in the brain and the body. The brain hates inflammation. So does your gut. So if, we're, if we have a mechanism here that can dampen inflammation and it involves the vagus nerve, which also could balance out your autonomics, well, this sounds like a pretty viable opportunity for a potential therapy. We also have a splenic sympathetic anti-inflammatory pathway. What this essentially utilizes is norepinephrine being released from the splenic sympathetic nerve. What it does is it also binds to lymphocytes that release acetylcholine inhibits tumor necrosis, necrosis factor alpha in a relatively similar mechanism. Well, why is this relevant? Well, we know that the vagus nerve is sensitive to pro-inflammatory mediators like IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and IL-1. And these are released when macrophages and immune cells are in a state of panic. What's interesting with this is that during some of the, ther during some of the studies that they've been performing, what they did is they induced a septic shock in, in rats specifically by injecting lipopolysaccharides into their brains, into their bodies. And what they found is that septic shock was actually prevented via vagal nerve stimulation, indicating a strong anti-inflammatory pathway presence that's important for the regulation of lipopolysaccharide inhibition. Well, what does this mean? Vagal nerve stimulation can be very, very effective at not only controlling inflammation and the autonomic dysfunction that occurs with migraines and headaches, but vagal nerve, station, vagal nerve stimulation is actually relatively invasive. And this is what it looks like. So this is, a, uh, this is a, an incision over the vagus nerve. And your vagus nerve can be found on either side of your neck. Your vagus nerve actually wraps around your carotid sheath, your carotid artery. And so what they do is they go and they cut a you know, four centimeter incision. And what they do is they actually put a helical electrode around that vagus nerve. They close that back up and they throw in a little regulator, almost like a pacemaker inside your chest. And, and what they do is they, they send different types of stimulations to that vagus nerve based off of different environmental factors. Well, for most of you on this call, you're probably not going to be doing any invasive vagal nerve stimulation or implanting any vagal nerve stimulators anytime soon. So what other options do you have? Well, interesting. Calixto Machado did a super cool study where he actually used low-level laser therapy over the left side of the neck to try and stimulate vagal nerve stimulation outcomes. And he did a QEEG. This is a QEEG, a quantitative EEG. We did baseline vagal nerve stimulation and post-vagal stimulation QEEGs. And what he found is with significant changes in the brain following a non-invasive procedure or therapy over the left side of the neck. And, and, it, and this is a really interesting study. I empower every single person on this call to check this study out because what they did is they actually used an Erconia low-level laser. And what he found was all it took was 10 minutes of low level laser therapy over the left side of the neck to be able to stimulate the brain. And now what he found interestingly was low level laser with violet light was actually one of the best treatments for epilepsy due to the reduction of paroxysmal brain activity. It calmed the brain down and it's specific mechanisms that would be really important for epilepsy. But what he found was that the combination of red and violet light would be useful for conditions like depression, facilitating neuro rehabilitation, dementia, autism, and even coma because it could increase brain activity and coupled blood flow. Well, 
in some of the lectures that I've talked to before, what happens with trauma and changes in blood flow and neurological activity? If I'm moving my right arm and I'm stimulating my left brain, my right cerebellum and my left frontal lobe are yoked together in that mechanism. And what I should see on a functional MRI is that I should see blood flow and neurological activity occurring simultaneously in these different areas of the brain. The problem is that with trauma and with different mechanisms based with inflammation, we actually see this uncoupled. So now that I'm stimulating my brain and I have all this neurological mechanism going on with my right cerebellum and my left frontal lobe, we actually see decreases in blood flow. Well, this is the exact mechanism that functional MRIs work on. And so what happens with trauma or different types of inflammatory states, we see different changes in coupled blood flow. Low level laser therapy, specifically over the left side of the neck, can be very, very influential with regulating vagal nerve tone through probably some of the same mechanisms that we talked about, right? The acetylcholine assisted anti inflammatory pathway, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. These are really important mechanisms because now we have a non invasive procedure that can have clinical outcomes and benefits for our patients. How could you apply this to, to migraines and headaches? Well, the underlying neurophysiology is there. You just have to be able to utilize it clinically in your office. So what does vagal, vagal nerve therapy look like? Well, yes, you can use a handheld laser over the left side of the neck, but what I love about use it, utilizing the FX635 is that I can literally set it and forget it. And this is a photo of a, of a patient of mine, and I have full access to be able to use this, so please don't come after me. Um, what I'm doing is I'm utilizing the low-level laser over this patient's gut. I also am having this patient do different types of things like belly breathing, humming, singing, I'm using super segmental influences. We know that the pons can help heavily have an influence on your midbrain or on, on your on your midbrain and also on your on your lower brain stem on the medulla. And so they all have influence. These homologous columns have an interesting um, connectivity and an in, 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 interesting integration with each other. And so I'm trying to promote different mechanisms like increasing digestion, having patients use things like maybe at different types of smells to increase salivation. You can also see too that I have a clip on this patient's ears. Well. I'm also doing transcranial, transauricular vagal nerve stimulation to try and stimulate the vagus nerve via the auricular branch in your, in your inner ear. There are multiple mechanisms at play in this photo. And what I'm trying to get to you is that there are a ton of opportunities and tools in your tool belt that you can use to stimulate the vagus nerve. Now, I prefer to utilize different types of low-level laser therapies because it's diverse. And I can use it in different ways, too, because if these patients have different types of structural issues, well, FDA has approvals for those, or, or Coney has approvals for the FDA for cervical spine and, and, and neck pain. And this is how easy it is for me to be able to utilize the FX635 in my office is I can literally have the patient sitting there. I can set it and forget it. I know that they're getting therapies. I know that they're getting benefits. And I don't have to do anything else, and I can go work with other patients. This FX635 stand has increased my revenue substantially because it allows me to see more patients in less time and be able to help more patients without me having to be physically present. Because as we dig into underlying mechanisms, yes, you have dysautonomia with migraines and headaches, but don't, under, don't underestimate the impact of trauma. Because we know that concussions, sport-related injuries, auto accidents, it can all have significant impacts on these different presentations. Motor vehicle accidents were associated with a higher frequency of primary neck pain compared to falls. Well, neck pain in a lot of in a lot of ways manifests as headaches. Just talk about those patients who have these different types of tension style headaches coming into your office. These chronic hypertonic suboccipital neck muscles that are always present. They're always being triggered by different types of mechanisms. These are really impactful for these patients, and there's a reason why a lot of doctors are always going to the cervical spine to treat, whether it's a manipulation, soft tissue modality, using different types of electric stimulation. These mechanisms are really important for us because even low velocities, and specifically dealing with concussions, auto accidents, low velocities can also, it can even induce whiplash. The cervical, the upper cervical spine is the most mobile part of the spine. And in a preliminary study, they actually showed low velocity impact between four to 12 uh, kilometers an hour could provoke head and neck injuries. This is far more complex than we give it credit for. Why? Because a head injury doesn't just involve the structural properties. It involves neurological properties. It can have central inflammatory mechanisms affecting your metabolic capacity. These Z joints in the back, in the back part of the neck are really impactful and they're impacted heavily with different types of trauma because this pain 
can actually be expressed as hypersensitivity and hyperexcitability of the spinal cord reflexes. Well, what can happen with that? Maybe you have increases in nociceptive signaling. Maybe now you have increased sympathetic windup, where now your sympathetic system is increased and your, and your, your parasympathetic system is being overridden. The most common post-traumatic symptom is a headache. Well, what do you think you could do with this? As a provider, what do you think an easy thing for you to be, be able to do? Use your tools, right? Do an examination. More importantly too, don't forget to look into the eyes. When we're talking about those three friends that go to the same party, right? The friend number one, muscles and joints. Friend number two, your vision, your eyes. And friend number three, your inner ear system. We know that trauma can skew neck and eye integration. These are the patients that come in where they're like, doc, I was in an accident. Or doc, I just had a football game tonight. And now I have a headache. My vision feels a little off. I feel a little bit different. I feel a little bit disconnected. You understand the mechanisms for what could be going on now. And you might be one of the few providers that actually is looking for finding ways to help these patients because just because they go see an optometrist doesn't mean that their eyes are okay. Maybe their physical eyeball is, but maybe their eyes are off. Maybe now they have a convergence that's efficiency. Maybe now their pursuits are off. Maybe their, their fast eye movements, their saccades are a little disconnected. Maybe they're dysmetric. They're not hitting targets as well. Reading becomes a problem for them. We know that patients with whiplash associated disorders and concussions can yield altered eye reflexes and smooth pursuit mechanisms. This is a classic hallmark test, right? Looking at the VOMS test, the visual oculomotor uh, integration test, really important for us to understand these mechanisms because these, pa these patients can present with headaches, with migraines. Maybe they don't tell you about the auto accident that they had years ago. Maybe they don't tell you about the concussion they had when they were in high school, but now they have chronic headaches or they have chronic migraines. These mechanisms are really important. And to really hammer this home, I want you to take your fingers and put them over the base of your skull, over your suboccipitals. Palpate your suboccipitals, and without moving your head or your neck in any way, shape, or form, I want you for the next 10 seconds to move your eyes back and forth, up and down, left and right, as fast as you can. What did you feel? By a show of hands, I wanna see if anybody felt any sort of activity, any sort of contraction relaxation of their muscles based off of you moving your eyes and not moving your head and your neck. Most of you, if not all of you, should have experienced that in some way, shape, or form. This is the mechanism, this is the exact mechanism for why most patients who come into your office might still be having some issues. Because not only are they having structural outcomes, and they're having neurological outcomes, but we understand that there's a, there's a lot more going on metabolically as well, too. This neurometabolic cascade can be a significant driver of chronic and sustained post-concussive or even post-traumatic whiplash outcomes. Like I said, some of these patients aren't going to tell you exactly what happened. Most patients rarely ever walk in telling you exactly how to treat them, right? So we know that cognitive deficits after a concussion can actually be based off this biochemical cascade. Well, here's what's interesting. Low level laser therapy can have a significant impact on neuroinflammation. It can reduce the pro inflammatory cytokines that are affected via NF kappa beta signaling, a rate limiting mechanism for the promotion of chronic inflammation. We know that, we know that in closed head models with, with TBI mouse models, low level laser therapy actually prevented the occurrence of secondary brain injury by suppressing IL 1B and IL, IL 16. That's really important for us. We also know that vagal nerve stimulation specifically probably over the left side of the neck, can suppress uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha production. So there's multiple mechanisms at play for this. And more importantly too, what we're starting to notice as well is that as we start seeing disruptions in different types of neurometabolic cascades and neuroinflammatory cascades, we see changes in gut function. Now we have gut permeability being a factor. Well, once you have gut permeability, and you have potential for lipopolysaccharides or different types of uh, immune responses occurring at the gut, these secondary mechanisms can actually occur and have an impact on the blood-brain barrier. We can have glial uh, um, priming. Now we start having these different types of inflammatory processes that are going on centrally as well too. And so disrupting this neurometabolic cascade is really important, whether it's for those patients who are in the acute phase of recovery or those patients who are in the chronic stage. Because right now, the best bet that we have is that but well, we tell people to go sit in a dark room if they just had a concussion or brain injury. Well, that's not wrong, but how long do you have to let these patients sit? 
how long would it cost, or how much money would it cost PSG to have Lionel Messi out for a few months versus a few weeks? What if you could accelerate that, that healing curve utilizing non-invasive non procedures like low-level laser therapy? But you can, right? These mechanisms are well established and the research is there too. Not only that, if you can utilize your low-level laser therapy over the gut, over the neck, over the brain, a lot of the same mechanisms in the same areas that you know are probably gonna be implicated with, with different types of trauma or different types of presentations, you can probably suppress this inflammatory cascade. We know that vagal nerve stimulation can suppress IL-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha production. It acts through that acetylcholine anti-inflammatory pathway. And this is where things get really interesting because they're now looking at vagal nerve stimulation uh, as a potential for treating rheumatoid arthritis because of its ability to suppress these inflammatory pathways. This is really powerful stuff. The sad thing is most patients and even providers aren't gonna know about this. On average, it takes anywhere from 12 to 17 years for research to become public knowledge. And by that time, the research has already changed. Do your patients have 12 to 17 years to wait to understand and get these mechanisms and these benefits from these therapies and these, this research? Do you as a provider wanna be 12 to 17 years behind by not knowing any of this stuff? No, and this is one of the reasons why you're doing what you're doing, right? You can have a, a tremendous amount of benefits by understanding these mechanisms. Even transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulation, what you saw me doing in that photo with my patient, can have significant impacts on quality of life for patients. This is a really interesting study because they did this with 55-year-old quote-unquote healthy individuals. Two weeks of daily transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulation improved autonomic function, quality of life scores, mood, and even sleep. Well, why is that? Well, you know your autonomics affect every single mechanism in, within your brain and body. What's interesting as well too is that it also significantly increased heart rate variability. And this is important because it's mostly through the reductions in the sympathetic activity. For the most part, most of your patients are gonna be walking in with increased sympathetic out, output. And that's a problem. That's what's promoting inflammation. That's what's promoting anxiety, alterations in sleep, gut function, immune suppression. And so if you can utilize vagal nerve stimulation, specifically a non-invasive mechanism of, of vagal nerve stimulation, you're going to have better outcomes. We've also found different mechanisms with the importance of magnesium. A meta-analysis found that intravenous magnesium was able to reduce migraine attacks within 15 to 45 minutes. It also helped at the 120 minute mark and 24 hours after the initial fusion. We also found oral magnesium can significantly alleviate the frequency and the intensity of migraines overall as well. Specifically, magnesium that can cross the blood-brain barrier. And I'm talking about magnesium 3 and 8. Magnesium 3 and 8, in my understanding, is the only magnesium that can actually cross the blood-brain barrier and have a, me have a central uh, mechanism within the brain and the nervous system. We know this because magnesium controls triggered cortical spreading depression. It can change levels of substance P, which is a pro-inflammatory mediator. And that can actually influence mitochondrial energy production and demand. Well, what other mechanism that we've talked about today affects mitochondria in a non-invasive way? Low-level laser, right? Time and time again, we'll come back to this. The aging population, all the biohackers, everybody who's looking at trying to stop aging or at least reverse it, is all coming to the conclusion that the mitochondria is the number one mechanism that we're trying to hack and infiltrate in order to optimize quality of life and, and more importantly, too, allowing people to live a life worth living in longevity, right? So, yes, we have, you know, different types of mechanisms for increasing oxygenation, blood flow, but what do they all come back to? Mitochondrial function. Low-level laser has all of these mechanisms at play. It, it utilizes me, uh, mitochondrial uh, functionalities, increases ATP, things that will never, ever, uh, you know, be, be uh, a problem. It will always be a problem. It will never be something that we will not be able to not utilize. More importantly, too, we have, we have different types of vasodilation properties with nitric oxide. We have reactive oxygen species that can be chemotaxic to different properties to bring in nutrients and have different mechanisms as well with uh, bringing different types of healing components to the cells. Secondarily, too, we know that low-level laser can affect the brain. So, you know, the, the basis of where, where headaches and migraines are really, you know, having an impact is on the central nervous system. If this is a sensory mismatch, if the main mechanism right now for looking at migraines and chronic pain and headaches is that it's a central sensory mismatch, if there are any mechanisms and ways for you to dampen inflammation, to optimize blood flow, and increase neurotrophic factors and have anti-inflammatory effects, then you should be doing it. And low-level laser, time and time again, has been shown to be really effective with this. We also see noticeable changes on a behavioral level 
um, through cognitive enhancement and, and improved sleep and antidepressant effects with the use of low level laser as well too. And this is one of the reasons why Arconia is currently doing research on autism is that there are some really interesting underlying mechanisms at play. Um, and what's important with this is that you as a, as a provider understand that you have tools in your tool belt to now go out and tackle these different, um, these different mechanisms at play with, with headaches and migraines. So from a, from a provider standpoint, what should you be doing? What, what would a patient with cervical spine dysfunction present like? What does your bedside look like? What does your bedside examination look like? What kind of questions do you need to ask these patients? Do you need to do imaging? Now you have options on the table, but this is really what our bedside examination should look like. You should always be doing a visual inspection of patients seated, supine, and standing because there are different cerebellar mechanisms at play. Utilize passive and active range of motion techniques, manual palpation, physical examination techniques, touching the spinal musculature, right? And then doing neuroorthopedic testing. Now, there are some really well-established tests that can determine central dysfunction and proprioceptive dysfunction. And these are listed here at the bottom and you can take a look at those, but don't underestimate the importance of looking at different types of vestibular mechanisms as well. Cervicogenic vertigo tests. I had a really cool discussion with um, Perrin to Tinder. I don't know if they're on this call tonight, but Per had a patient come in with vertigo that wasn't getting better, wasn't going away, epi maneuvers were clean. And what he started doing was he started doing soft tissue therapies and mechanisms on the cervical spine. Patients started feeling better, right? So no matter how far we are down the chain of understanding neurology and looking into neuroscience, don't underestimate the power of utilizing the proprioceptive and cervical spine to change the brain and body. And this is one of the things that can be really powerful using low level laser over the neck too. As you're dampening inflammation, you're optimizing blood flow, and you're inhibiting pain. These are really important mechanisms for healing. More importantly with this too, one of the underlying and fundamental mechanisms for migraines is that there's autonomic dysfunction, that trigeminal vascular dur dural mechanism that we established early on. That's really important for us because what's changing? You're changing blood flow. You're changing underlying metabolic processes. So you have to do autonomic testing. You have to look at them seated versus standing. You have to look at them at rest and when they're active. You also have to do supine pulse ox and blood pressure testing. Different types of tilt table testing, using your high low table to say, what is oxygenation and blood flow like at 15 degrees, 30, 45, 60? You're challenging the nervous system, you're challenging the vestibular system as well to determine the outcomes. And if there's any changes in heart rate variability, pulse oxygenation, heart rates, even breathing rates, then this is a really good mechanism for you to look into for establishing POTS and dysautonomia. And I see this all the time with patients. Now, the traditional medical model uses tilt table testing for diagnosing but you can actually use tilt table testing for diagnosing and treating because you can do therapies with patients at different levels, utilizing low level laser therapy, visual mechanisms, soft tissue modalities. I mean, the, the list is endless. But don't forget the simplicity of checking heart rate variability, pulse ox and, and heart rate mechanisms as well when they're just doing basic things, right? Pre and post after an adjustment, after a soft tissue modality, are you pushing their autonomics? If you are, you have to take a look at that and understand that mechanism. Maybe they're not getting better because you're pushing their autonomic nervous system. Look at the chest breathing and heart auscultation. Look at the abdominal auscultation. These are basic mechanisms that we were taught in school or should have been taught in school that sometimes we forget. Now, autonomic dysfunction can manifest in multiple different ways. And there's an array of things that you can do in your clinic, but you have to find what works best for yourself. Because at the end of the day, all of this really comes down to one thing. You being able to have all the tools in your tool belt to be able to help these patients. And so I hope you were able to take away some actionable items or at least a better understanding of migraines, headaches, autonomic dysfunction, and how to utilize these different mechanisms and these different tools. There's a reason why I enjoy speaking for Aconia is that they've gone through and they've done the dirty work with getting their, their, um, their tools and their, their lasers FDA approved. That means that they've had to go through and do double blind, multi-site, placebo controlled studies to be able to have them to be able to say that they've gone through the FDA approval process. And this is important because I want to know at the end of the day that I'm helping my patients as much as I can. And so I hope that you've been able to take some of this information away. Uh, as people know from my previous lectures, I love uh, having people reach out. You, you're inevitably going to have questions. And so if there are ways for me to be able to answer that, here's my contact information. So uh, it's probably gonna, you're probably going to have a hard time calling our clinic phone number if you're in the UK or anywhere else outside of the United States. But um, please feel free to reach out. I'm an open book. I'm always learning um, and I'm always open to having a conversation about uh, different patient presentations and clinical mechanisms. So uh, with that, Simon, I'd like to turn it over to you. And I'm sure we have some questions from uh, viewers that we're probably going to answer. So 
Simon, you can feel free to pop back on and take it away. Sorry, Eric, I was having a few connection difficulties there. Uh, brilliant presentation, uh, very informative. Um, there's been a couple of questions come in. Um, I've answered one of them about the frequency of laser treatments, saying we normally start with twice a week, but it's very flexible, um, either to have more frequent or less frequent. I'm not quite sure what you promote in your clinic, Eric, or if it, is it something similar to that? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, it just depends on the frequency you're seeing patients. Um, you know, this is the hard thing with those questions. It's like, how many treatments is, is it going to take for the patient to get better, even with a manual therapy? We don't know, right? So it's always trial and error, trying to figure out what works best for them. What I would say is that as long as you're supporting them with other mechanisms, um, you know, you should be able to get away with one or two times a week. Every patient's different. It just depends on the kind of the patient population that you see. So that's my uh, doctor cop out answer, I guess, on that on that question. So there you go. I mean, you know, we're lucky. We we've, we've got them ourselves, so I can treat myself every day if uh, if I feel a need. But you know, it's a lot down to patient availability as well, and being able to get into the clinic. So, um, yep. There's another question. It just says muscle engagement. It's a pretty direct question. Just muscle engagement. Is the question of uh, how to how to activate muscle engagement, or you can answer it like that. It just actually says muscle engagement. So, um, probably different meanings in question. Got you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I can give an answer. I guess if that's for muscle engagement, are they are they asking how to engage muscles? Or I guess I can't see any of the questions, Simon. So I apologize. Yeah, it, all it says is uh, from Lola. It just says muscle engagement. Um, there's a follow-up okay. question which says balance disturbance in the elderly. Would you recommend non-thermal low-level laser? If you want to, yeah, go absolutely. Below that, maybe Lola will leave a different question. Yeah. Well, so so when we're looking at balance issues with the elderly, right? So what we know is as we age, we lose muscle mass. So there's obviously a hypertrophy mechanism at play, a sarcopenia mechanism, right? So a loss of muscle. But, but uh, what they're finding too, and this is really interesting, they've done different types of studies where they're actually doing like visual and vestibular rehabilitation, and they can actually improve people's balance based off of that. Well, when I'm with patients and I have them on my B tracks and we're doing balance therapies, I just throw the laser literally straight over the back of the head. So you know, if I have a patient who's coming in with dizziness or they have some sort of balance problem, I'll literally, you know, have the, the laser over the mastoid, which is which is where your inner ear system lives, we'll say, the peripheral, the, the peripheral organ anyways, um, and I'll throw it over the back of the head. So this serves two things. One, I, I'm trying to stimulate their inner ear system. I'm trying to dampen inflammation, but I'm also, too, giving this anti-inflammatory, anti-nociceptive mechanism to calm down their neck muscles and inhibit pain as well. So... Uh, that's, that's pretty much a yes and answer for somebody doing uh, different types of like postural or balanced exercises in the elderly. And, and to be honest with you, it wouldn't matter how old they are. Just making sure that that mechanism is understood would be really powerful. Great. Thanks for that. Yeah, it was just, um, just uh, the muscle engagement wasn't actually a question. Um, right. What else can we get? Can we get a copy of the slides, please, um, from Rebecca? I'm sure you don't mind. That, always. Eric. Yep. Always well. Okay. Right. Let me try to um, uh, pronounce this word correctly. Um, could you describe the trigeminal durovascular system? Is that pronounced? Trigeminal, that? yep, a trigeminal. If you get next <laughs> to it, it's not. So, so your trigeminal system, so your trigeminal nerve is your fifth cranial nerve, and, and, and it, it's, or it originates in your pons. Um, your trigeminal nerve supplies Different, if there's there's motor and there's sensory mechanisms, right? So um, the motor mechanisms are like muscles of mastication, chewing. Uh, there's different components from from a motor standpoint of like vascularity and blood flow. And so this trigeminal uh, dural vascular disconnect is essentially just saying that your trigeminal system, your cranial nerve five, is a little bit dysfunctional. Now this cranial nerve five gets a lot of integration from different sensory areas and other areas of your brain. And so they don't understand why the trigeminal system becomes dysfunctional, but it does. And so what it does is it alters different mechanisms like blood flow, right? So it's a chicken or egg question. Well, is it the blood flow or is it the trigeminal system? Well, we know that, the, you know, the, the, the blood flow will follow the nerve, right? So your arteries have contractile, vasoconstrictive, and vasodilative properties. It's controlled by your trigeminal nervous system or your trigeminal complex. So you have two of them. They both go on the sides, right? And so what you can do 
is you can kind of take a look and say, you know, do a cranial nerve exam. Is the trigeminal nervous system you know, appropriate? Are you having, you know, different mechanisms? Can they chew? Can they swallow? Can they, can they have trigeminal integration? Your trigeminal system uh, is complex. It's, to be honest with you, it's not fully mapped out. There's a lot of integration with it. Um, but that trigeminal system is primarily responsible for blood flow and different mechanisms. And so looking at that, that's really the, the, the primary mechanism right now for what migraines and why they set in is that there's some sort of alteration in your sensory inputs. So the inputs don't match the outputs or the expected outputs. That sensory information comes in, skews integration in that trigeminal system. Now the trigeminal system changes blood flow or vascularity to the rest of the brain. And you start having these prodromal changes. You have neurological outcomes as a result of that. Um, and there's just different mechanisms at play that we don't have to necessarily get into, but just understanding that your trigeminal system is altered should give you enough ammo. Well, what do you think you could do with that? You could stimulate the vagus nerve because your vagus system is going to calm down that inflammatory response or that sympathetic windup, that sympathetic response that a lot of people come in with. Interestingly enough, too, uh, your trigeminal system and your vagal system are in these homologous columns. So they kind of talk and communicate to each other. So when you activate one, you actually can activate the other. It's like you know, cousins, like cousins are related, but they don't live with each other, but they still have influence and direct contact with each other. And so these homologous column mechanisms can be really impactful for that. So uh, that's why they're looking at vagus nerve stimulation for treating migraines is that it changes vascularity, has an impact on the pons, the lower brain stem. And so those mechanisms aren't fully mapped out yet, but those are some of the leading theories as to why it changes blood flow via a, a, a neurological mechanism is really what it comes down to. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer of that. So yeah, no, that was a great answer. That's yeah, I think pretty much every webinar we do now, there's some sort of reference to the vagus nerve. Um, it, it's being uh, used in laser treatments a lot more, especially with non-thermal laser. Ravi did finish off that actually by saying, is it activated by peripheral changes at the dura, which activates the system to cause pain? I think you pretty much answered that. Yeah, yep. It's a central mechanism. Uh, yeah. Um, I think Sasha is one of our uh, EVRL customers basically saying, uh, she tends to, um, uh, she does two days a week, starts offering uh, this option after seeing a USA laser webinar a month or so ago. The clients were traveling very long distances for laser treatment. It can be flexible to do with the therapist and client availability. Actually, sorry, no, I've misread that. She's saying she does twice a day um, in the morning and then in the afternoon because she has some clients that travel a lot, uh, you know, long distances to get there. So, I suppose that just shows the, um, it, it depends very much on availability and, and what suits your patients. Um, well, I have patients. Why we actually have one so I can treat myself every day, but you know, um, it, it's, it, it's ultimate flexibility. Well, I have patients that travel from all over the place to come see me for an entire week. And so I, I use laser two, sometimes three times a day if I think that they need it. So, I mean, the, the variability is definitely there. It just comes down to your clinical you know, perspective and, and, and I'm always looking at autonomics. So, you know, I understand the mechanisms or what's happening. And if I push somebody too much, you know, my goal is always to get them to come back to neutral, if not, you know, be in the best position possible to handle my therapy. So it's really up to the provider on that. Yeah. Cause I think also as well in your clinic in Minneapolis, you rent the lasers out as well, don't you? I do. Yeah. Um, for patients who get a lot of benefit, who can't come and make it into the clinic, or if they're at a point where they're doing home therapies, exercises and kind of self-sustaining, um, I have some patients that just, they swear that they can't have without it. I mean, um, interestingly enough, so some of the nerve ablation tests and studies uh, and, and procedures that they're doing. So, you know, a lot of people come in with suboccipital pain and chronic uh, hypertension, hypertonicity of their suboccipital muscles. You know, they're doing nerve blocks or doing Botox or doing a bunch of things. Clinically, you know, we do soft tissue modalities, adjustments, their manual therapies. Um, what they'll do in the States, and I don't know if they do this over here, Simon, but they do uh, nerve ablation uh, procedures. Well, they literally will like solder off the occipital nerves on the back of the neck. Well, it sounds great in theory, right? If those nerves are upset or they're inflamed, get rid of them. Well, the problem with that is that nerves don't like being burned off. And so now they come back, they're more upset, they promote inflammation. And now these patients just have this yeah. raging chronic pain at the back of their neck. I have a patient right now who uh, has seen probably the most benefit out of any of the things that I've done with her with just literally putting there, putting low level laser over her neck. And she's at the point now where she's probably just going to just buy one and, and use it on her own because it'll save her money in the long run, but she just feels so good with it. And it's been one of the biggest changes in her life over the last four or five years of her dealing with this. 
that she is at the point where she's going to be purchasing a laser. She rented for, it rented from us for a long time, and now she's at the point where she just wants it at home and doesn't have to worry about the recurrent costs. But uh, I'd be lying to say that a lot of patients don't find it, they find it really appealing to be able to rent it because they want to try it for a month, see if they like it. And then, you know, at that point, it's, it's just figuring out what a long-term solution looks like for them. But renting the laser out has been very effective for us because it's allowed us to, once again, multiply providers, help more patients. And it's a recurring revenue generator for me where I don't have to do anything and I'm still making money with it. Yeah, no, definitely. I think even if we go back to the research that we've done on, the, um, on uh, fat loss, um, you know, no matter what you're treating with non-thermal laser, it's specific to, you know, um, delivering billions of photons through our line coherent beams into the mitochondria of the cell to create a photochemical reaction. We noticed that on around the 18 minute mark that um, the photoreceptors stopped responding. Um, nothing um, else would specifically happen. They just stop responding. So what we'd normally say with them is try to give sort of a four or five hour break in between treatments, but that's specifically just targeting the same area. You know, you can treat, you can target multiple areas. It just depends on the photoreceptors in that specific area you're treating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Lola, who's one of Vanessa's um, customers in the UK, who's relatively new, she's saying, I have had a breakthrough with laser for treatment of Bell's palsy, uh, RHS variation with the EVRL. Have you treated any Bell's palsy patients, Eric, in, the, in your time? Yeah, a lot. A lot of them, actually. Um, <clears throat> Bell's palsy, I mean, and then, um, you know, the, the HSV, the, so the herpes simplex virus, she's talking about um, Ramsey Hunt syndrome. So for those who don't know that, what's going on is that if you have a viral infection, uh, specifically a herpetic, herpetiform viral infection that uh, attacks the, um, the, the cranial nerve seven. So it's peripheral nerve infection. And I think Justin Bieber had this a while ago. I don't know why I know that, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it's, an, it's an inflammatory cascade and it's an immune cascade of the nerve and the nerve becomes inflamed. You have a paralysis of the nerve. It's a peripheral nerve palsy. Um, and why is laser effective with that? Well, what does it do? It dampens inflammation, right? Stimulates mitochondrial production. Neurons are full of mitochondria. You need them. Uh, it promotes new, um, it promotes the production of nitric oxide, so it brings more blood flow to the tissue. Specifically with the EVRL, though, I mean, you have the violet, violet laser, the 405 nanometer wavelength, and that's really anti-fire, antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial. So, yes, you use the laser. For a lot of these patients, too, I use a lot of peripheral nerve stimulation because I want that, I want that nerve to become active and healthy again, and I want to get some tone back into that face. And so what I'll do is I'll use these different uh, peripheral nerve stimulators over these three trigeminal areas. So you have a, a distribution of three separate branches of the trigeminal nerve that comes out of the TMJ over here. And what I do is I'll stimulate all three of those branches with a peripheral vagal or peripheral nerve stimulator to get the muscles to contract while simultaneously doing laser. So you're having an anti-inflammatory effect, but you're also stimulating the peripheral nerve to get proto-oncogene expression, get more uh, proteins to be produced to maintain the cellular integrity of the nerve and continue to feed back into that brainstem so we can inhibit pain as well. So there's a couple ways to go about that. If you got the laser, use the laser. Um, but there's 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 some interesting ways to go about that and use the nervous system as well too to, to rehabilitate. Yeah. It's a lot of it just opening up the channels of communication at a cellular level. Yeah, it's all it's all integration, right? I mean, inputs need to match outputs. I just continuously come back to that. Your brain is so efficient and it's so good at compensating. And when it does, and you know things should be okay. When you really notice big changes, then then you've got a lot to work on. And um, there's a reason why you got a bunch of nerves all over your brain and body, and 85 billion neurons throughout your nervous system. I mean, <laughs> they're all needed, right? And so, um, yeah, it, you can you can do so much with these patients. It's just uh, you just got to think outside the box and understand the the brain and these mechanisms at play. And then your your tools are your ability to rebuild anyone's house. Yeah, definitely. You know, it can be so frustrating for us because being an American subsidiary company, there are, um, we can only really promote what we have the FDA studies promote. You alluded yeah. to earlier, one of them is a product that we haven't um, launched yet, but to have 21 out of the 24 US FDA market clearances given to low level laser, but yourself and so many of our clients use the lasers on so many things off label that I wish we could talk more about on a regular basis as a company. Um, but you know how the FDA works in the U.S. We can only really talk about, you know, um, yeah. what we have studies to promote. Yeah, well, and that's that's the hard part, too, is I'm always trying things clinically, right? So, I mean, the hard part with that is that 
clinical practice is literally what it is, it's practice, right? So you're always yeah. learning things that work and don't work. And then clinical practice informs pilot studies and preliminary research, and then preliminary research catches on. And then that's where they start getting to the bigger cohorts. And then over time, that's when that's when things become, you know, research and, and evidence-based, right? So, but, you know, for me, um, with my patients, I will do anything that I can for them. And as long as they understand that I'm trying things, right? They at least understand the thought process as to why we would do something. Then they're usually okay with me trying that. And, um, you know, I don't necessarily think that I'm better than anybody. I think I'm different. And I just let my clinical outcomes, I guess, speak for themselves. So yeah. um, most patients that make their way to my clinic, and I'm sure for a lot of people on this call, uh, they've gone down the traditional routes. And so they're looking for anything else. And so I kind of yeah. just feel like it's my job to give them hopefully a different approach. Yeah, no, I agree. I think you've got to find something that's right for you. I mean, in Europe, especially, we're um really stepping up the the education with regard to low level laser because there's various different mechanisms of action which fall under that umbrella including the likes of infrared which delivers less energy a little bit more heat led which is a non-coherent uh, unidirectional light um, and a lot of the outcomes can be like day and night so we want to try to educate practitioners as to what the differences are between these different mechanisms and then whichever one is right for them is the one that they go down, but at least they're doing it based on factual evidence rather than actually thinking they have something if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. Right, I think that is it when it comes to the questions. Um, something's actually just changed there. Um, Eric, again, you know, we've been over the moon since you came across you and you've helped us out massively. Um, you're a very popular speaker on our circuit. You come across very clearly and eloquently, and we very much appreciate your time. Um, and I will let you go now. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. I always appreciate that. So uh, looking forward to doing this again, uh, hopefully next month or in another month. So we've got, we've got more content coming. I think for those who are attending these seminars, like uh, feedback is really important. So um, good, bad, whatever you got, I'm open to it. And, you know, any topics of discussion that people really want to dig into, I'm happy to put together, you know, an hour long presentation for you. So please be open and honest, let us know what you're looking for. And we're looking forward to uh, building relationships and uh, continuing to get some education out there for everybody. Sure. I think we, we, we'll, we're we going to discuss some more seminars now that everything's at reopening again after COVID. Yes, the webinars are great. It allows people to come on from the comfort of their own home. Yep. But actually coming along to a seminar or to a workshop and having physical hands-on experience, I think, yep. um, it's got to be the next step for us. Uh, but if anybody is um, interested, we are at the end of September. We've got Dr. Trevor Berry coming over from Arizona, who's doing lectures at the Dutch chiropractic um, in, uh, I can't remember the name of the town. It's uh, quite close to Amsterdam. That's all I know. Uh, we've got Dr. Rob Silverman coming across the pond in uh, start of September uh, to help out at the Swiss Chiropractic, which I think you probably would have been at, uh, Eric, but you're heading back over the pond yourself uh, mm -hmm. during that time. So we're going to get out to as many um, countries as what we possibly can to try to carry on the education. Uh, thanks very much to, to everybody for, for tuning in tonight. We'll let you go now to have your dinner. And um, any questions, just ask us. Uh, you know where we are. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.